Hi, I'm so glad that you joined us today. If you have your Bible, I'd ask that you would turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5. And here the word says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was brought upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. At the end of every year, well, at least here in Maine, um, one hunter may turn to a, a fellow hunter and, and ask, did you get your deer yet? Did you get your deer? Well, this year the question is a little different with a much broader uh, audience to whom the question is given. And the question is very common today being asked by many adults is, did you get your vaccination? Well, <laughs> I received my, my second shot, my vaccination, the Friday before Palm Sunday. It was a pretty routine medical procedure. Now, it is my desire that now that I've been immunized, I will have the freedom to visit more people in the hospital. That's what I'd like to do and not carry the virus home back to my dad and to others here in the church. About three to four times a year, we here at New Horizons Community Church, we hold a blood drive and we provide uh, a facility for the American Red Cross to come and donors from all around the area to come and give blood. Uh, a transfusion is also a medical routine procedure in which the donated blood is provided to someone through a, a narrow tube and it's placed within your arm. This potentially life-saving procedure can help replace blood loss due to surgery or injury. A blood transfusion can also help if an illness prevents your body from making blood or some of the blood's components correctly. A blood transfusion, it is important. Now, there are groups that don't believe in blood transfusions. Uh, one that I know of is uh, the Jehovah's Witness. And I think Christian science is another one that's out there. Maybe there might be more, I don't know. There were two missionary doctors working in India. Both were surgeons and they were frustrated by the unwillingness of most of the Indians to donate blood. See, to the Indians, blood was the life, and they couldn't get past the idea of sacrificing any of their precious life force. Parents were often unwilling to donate blood to save the lives of their own children. One day, a 12-year-old girl was brought into their hospital, suffering from a severely diseased lung that needed to be removed immediately the surgeon would require at least three pints of blood. Fortunately, the girl was an AB positive type, a universal recipient, meaning that she could receive blood from any donor, regardless of type. But the hospital had only two pints of blood on hand, so they needed one more from the family. Now, after learning this, uh, they conferred together and the family pooled their money and offered to buy the additional pint. But Dr. Reeves, one of the surgeons, explained that there was no blood to be bought. And if the family didn't provide it themselves, well, they might as well just take the little girl back home to die. So they huddled together once more. And finally, they pushed forward an old, frail woman, weighing under 100 pounds, the smallest and weakest member of the family. And Dr. Betts looked around at the, the healthy, well-fed men who made that decision, and he lost his temper. In his broken Tamil dialect, he berated the dozen or so other family members, jabbing his finger back and forth, pointing at the, the strong men and the frail old woman. They cowered in the face of his anger. But even then, no one stepped forward. Finally, Reeves, he rolled up his own sleeve and he told his colleague, Dr. Brand, I can't stand by and let this little girl die. Take my blood. Finally, the family fell silent and watched in awe as Paul cuffed his arm, slipped the needle in his vein, and the rich red flow spurred it into a bottle. A collective ah sound rose from among the family members, and Reeve heard them saying, look, the Sahib doctor is giving his own life. It was an act of sacrificial love in their eyes, one that witnessed to them more than any sermon could have ever done, and it saved the little girl's life. The stripes, the stripes on the back of Jesus. Now that is a promise of a healing. The word says, but he was wounded 
for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was brought about him, and by his stripes we are healed. He promises a physical healing. People who receive blood transfusions for many reasons, such as surgery, injury, disease, and of course, bleeding disorders. When we go to the hospital, they tell us that they need a blood transfusion because of a sickness or a disease or an operation, that it's to help us heal. They, the doctors, you know, they, when they, they know that there is a need for a blood transfusion, well, what happens is, is a transfusion provides the part or parts of the blood that you need. When our Heavenly Father planned that redemption that was going to be needed, he set that the blood would be the important part of our forgiveness of sin. The Old Testament, in the covenant, there was a place for the atonement of sin. Scripture points that the blood was the life. The sacrificed animal that was brought to pay for our sins was slain and the blood was sprinkled upon the altar and upon the elements of the altar. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 21 and 23 says, in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. Verse 22 goes on to say, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The blood is the life. Try living without any blood in your body. It is impossible. And you know that they've never made a synthetic or artificial or, or fake blood. They can't, or we would never run out or be in short supply of any blood. Every two seconds, someone in the United States needs more blood. But blood can't be made in the lab. It must come from another person. And not just any person, he or she, well, they must have the same blood type as the person who's going to receive it. They give blood that match the same blood type you have or that that is compatible with our blood type. For a transfusion to be safe, the doctor must make sure the blood type matches that of the donor. If the blood type doesn't match your immune system, well, it'll attack it and you can die because of it. So let me tell you something. The blood is very important and hospitals and blood banks, they make sure that if you're going to have a transfusion, they do everything they can to make sure that it is indeed a match and that there's no mix up. But sadly, there are about 20 deaths a year because of the wrong blood is being given. The scripture tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now the devil has caused us to need a transfusion, a blood transfusion. In the Garden of Eden, when he deceived Eve, he caused sin to make a pathway into our hearts. When Eve gave it to Adam, well, what happened there? Well, he caused sin to make a home in the human heart. It was planted in each of us, and it is called carnality or the carnal nature. Each one of us has it. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin, and the blessed Holy Spirit applies his sanctifying power and cleansing from this, this old nature of carnality. When we are entirely sanctified, our hearts are aligned with God the Father's. So what is his heart? Well, his heart, well, it's mastered by his love that drives him beyond what we would consider maintenance mentality. But what are we, his children, like? What are we after? Well, often it's self-promotion. In a selfish attitude, we could say something like, can you believe that last potluck dinner, that line again, I'm last in line again, doggone it. Boy, am I ticked off. And they honored what's his name. And the work that I do around here, well, I work just as hard. Can you believe it? After all I've given and done for this church, they didn't even elect me to this or that board or didn't even include me in the planning. Well, Jesus says, I'm calling you to align your heart after the Father's heart. We have one problem, though, and it's carnality, a self-centered focus. One explanation why many churches, including ours, won't grow, it's a self-centered focus. 
Are we preoccupied with ourselves, New Horizons? There is only one reason that we don't own Central Maine as a place to serve and worship. The only reason that people get mad or upset and get up the myth tree is a self-centered focus. We are content. We spend hour after hour on ourselves. How many hours do we spend on the needs of others? That's a great question. We need to get back on our knees and back to the vision of the missing of the kingdom and then go out and do it. What would happen if the church would spend the hours and the money and the energy that are spent on other items if they were spent on prayer and visitation and simple calling? Spend the time in energy weeping and crying before God for the lost, the hurting, for the church. What would happen? Revival, Jesus says. Disciple, I'm calling you to align your heart with the Father's heart. I want you to see what he sees. Move as he moves. I want you to spend your energy on what the Father expends his on. Get the Father's attention. Get the Father's action. What gives God pleasure? What gives God, say, goosebumps? It's when our hearts, when our hearts are aligned with his seeking the lost or the pre-churched. Have you ever gotten God excited? Have you? When you come into the worship center on Sunday morning and you look over the crowd, ask yourself this question, the following question. Who is here because of you? Jesus wants you to align your heart, yourself, with the Father's. He says, I want you to see as he sees. I want you to feel as he feels with the same persistence that you fought for yourself. I want you to fight the same way for others, the same way you babied and pampered yourself. I want you to baby and pamper others that way. I want you to care for others. A young man came and asked Plato if he could teach him philosophy. Well, the young man seemed desperate to learn, so desperate that Plato told him to come the next morning at 6 a.m. The next morning, a little before 6, the man was standing outside Plato's door. Plato walked out at 6 a.m. sharp, not looking around, and walked down the dusty road. The young man followed him as he tried his best so that he could walk in Plato's actual footsteps. Walking by the great philosopher and all the time thinking, he's going to teach me, he's going to teach me a great lesson, I must not miss it. All day long they walked and Plato didn't say a thing. All day long the young man followed, concentrating on the lesson. Finally, in the evening, they came to a lake. Plato walked into the lake and the young man still followed, concentrating, as not to miss the lesson. Up to the shoulders the water came and the young man felt two hands on his head forcing him down into the water. Concentrating on the lesson, he held his breath as long as he could. Finally, Plato pulled his head from the water, coughing and choking. The young man asked, Plato, what was the lesson? Plato said, when you want to learn philosophy as badly as your lungs want air, you come back. Do you want to win others to the Lord as badly as your lungs want air? You will be the leadership team member you should be when you want lungs in your air as badly as you want to reach the lost. You will be the Sunday school teacher you should be when you want it as badly as your lungs want air. You'll be the Christian you should be when you want it as badly as your lungs want air. When you will be the Christian you should be as badly as your lungs want air, then and only then, will you have the Father's heart. When you get close to the Father's heart, you see your own heart for what it really is, and you too can see how stuck we are on ourselves. We see our self-excuses. We see our self-justification. And when we get close to the Father's heart, we see the self-centered focus of our own hearts. So what bothers me is not that we don't witness, but that we can keep from witnessing. How can we do that? What bothers me is not that we don't grow, but we are satisfied to merely maintain. The problem 
is that we are satisfied. And we are. We're too content. We need to come to the Father's heart until we are no longer satisfied with the status quo. This needs to stop. We need to come close to the Father's heart until we burn with what burns Him. With what He burns with until we are consumed with what he is concerned with, to get rid of that sin that we call it, we, you know, the, the, the carnal nature. To do that, to get rid of it, we need a blood transfusion. When they give you a blood transfusion in the hospital, it can and mostly will save your life. If you have type O, your health professional will call you a universal donor. You can give blood safely to anyone. Only 7% of the people have this blood type. If you have AB positive blood, you're a universal recipient. You can receive blood from any donor and your body will not attack it. AB blood also makes you a universal plasma donor. You can donate plasma, the plasma part of your blood, to all types of blood because it doesn't have the A or B antigens. The rarest major blood type is AB negative. Uh, only 1% of the population has it. Can I tell you something? That may be the rarest blood type to have in humanity, and it may help to have some people lives physically, but I know of a blood type that we need to have that will keep us living forever, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for my sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The thing is, this AB negative may be the rarest blood to have as a human, but the best transfusion is to have the blood of Jesus to wash you from all your sins. Without being washed in the blood of Jesus, we will not make heaven our home. We will not be with our loved ones in heaven. So if you haven't had that blood transfusion, I'm asking right now, as we close this broadcast, that you simply just pray this prayer with me. And don't just move your lips, move your heart. Mean what you say. See, one of the problems that God had in the Old Testament with so much of, of the, uh, the Israelites is that he said they, they speak so much with their, their lips, their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. Let's move our hearts today close to God. Let me pray for you and with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that it is your desire to draw us to you. You are our Abba Father. You're, you're like our daddy calling us home. And today, Lord, we come running. Lord, we need that blood transfusion. And we know that without the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins, we will continue to be sick. To be sick in that carnal nature. And Lord, that carnal nature is what makes the headlines. But each one of us could write we stand here in a complete need of your grace, would you wash our sins away by the blood of your Son, Jesus? And Father, what a privilege it is to know that we can be called a child of God, live in that grace and under the power of the Holy Spirit. Make ourselves available to you because you made yourself available to us. So as we, we part from the, this house of in this broadcast, Lord, may we walk in your spirit, may we walk in your strength, and Lord, by your grace, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm, I'm so glad you joined us today. Now, now, look, some of you prayed that prayer, and I'm, I'm so glad that you did. If you did, we would love to hear from you. Uh, again, my name is Brian Hale, and this is the New Horizons Community Church located in Skowhegan, Maine, and we'll have all that information following the broadcast. But if you do not have a home church and you live in the Skowhegan area, we would love to have you join us for our worship services. Every Sunday at 10 a.m., we're right where we praise and we lift up the name of Jesus and we encourage one another. So please, think about it. Give us a call. We'd love to meet with you. Until next time, God bless you.